Hello and welcome to this audio commentary for the 2004 Thai horror film Shutter. That is the 2004 original and most definitely not the 2008 US remake. Uh, although I will obviously be referencing that. This is being recorded as part of the Rental Breakdown project, which looks at the history and cultural impact of Blockbuster. And as part of this, I've recorded a number of film commentaries, uh, mostly on the big hitters, very well-known horror films that were requested. So The Shining, The Exorcist. And I wanted to cover Shutter to give a lot of attention to something that was far less well-known. That was probably uh, something that a lot of people hadn't seen and therefore is relatively underexplored. And we can have quite a few interesting conversations launching off the back of this film because I would say there's quite a lot going on in it. And it'll have a lot of interesting features simply for being a foreign film, some coming from a culture that's very different to ours. And so I hope you enjoyed this commentary. I hope you found it very interesting. Uh, as for why I'm not doing the American remake, well, <laughs> I believe this is most definitely the superior film. We have got a very long credit sequence here, so I've got a, a little bit of time to set the scene here. This is most definitely the superior version of Shutter. And it was so popular that it was remade four times, I believe. Um, it's sup And what makes it so successful, I would say, is that it does what Scream does best. Shutter takes horror logic that is usually quite silly and it integrates it intelligently into the story. So something that would be a really cheap jump scare that we sort of write off as a bit of a cliche, a bit of a trope, they use it for an excellent setup, a payoff, and some foreshadowing that makes this film absolutely brilliant to rewatch. So I'm hoping to get into that and some of the issues it raises. I'll set a bit more of the ground for you. Not a very long credit sequence here, so we'll go a little more into the history. This is uh, directed and written by Banjong Pisan Tanakun and Park Pum Mong Pum. Uh, apologies for any mispronunciations over the course of this film. I will be doing my best. Um, Banjong Pisanakun and Pak Bumong Pum were 24 and 25 when they made Shudder, so this is very impressive early filmmaking from them. And they also had co-writing assistance from Sopon Sukdapitset. Uh, this is very much a Thai production with Thai people set in Thailand, and it's going to have so much um, undiluted Thai cultural influence. But I think we'll also detect over the course of this a couple of interesting American influences. So I think they've very much been inspired by the wider horror scene. As much as I'm going to complain about, say, the American horror remakes that just uh, rip off the Asian horrors, Shutter absolutely does take inspiration from the very successful Japanese horror films. So it's sort of fair play. Similar to how uh, Akira Kurosawa uh, took inspiration from um, uh, from Shakespeare in direct in his films Ran and Throne of Blood. So cultural exchange, it's all fair game basically, as long as it's done well. Now the directors uh, largely stayed in horror after the success of this. Oh, just while we're here, look, here are our starting characters. Now is this some character building at this uh, post-wedding scene? Are we getting a sim from this empty room, basically no one else there but these characters, are we being told that they are party animals who've had a great night, or are we getting a, a hint that they wanted to save money on extras? Well, I'll leave it to you to decide. I'll leave it to you. <laughs> um, however, I'll point out that this film was made on a budget of $125,000, adjusted uh, for American dollars there, and it took in... 2.584 million. This is that classic story of a horror movie being made cheap and being incredibly profitable. And so you can sort of understand why uh, why it's why the directors stayed in horror, understandably, you know. Uh, this was uh, number one in the Thai box office. Um, was popular enough to get four remakes. Uh, the US version kept the title, whereas it's been remade in Telugu, Tamil, and Hindi under various titles like Click and Shutter. Uh, very successful. The directors, as I said, stayed in horror. They worked together again on a film called Alone in 2007, and uh, they did two Thai horror anthologies, Forbia 
and Phobia 2. And they also contributed a segment to the American production, The ABCs of Death, which had a horror short for each letter of the alphabet. They had, they had the N segment. N is for nuptials, obviously, obviously. By the way, well, one of the joys of a foreign film here. She's come over, she said, uh, what's so funny? No, she didn't say that at all, by the way. Now, I am not fluent in Thai at all, but I will tell you that what she came over and said was Sawat di ka, which is just saying hi. It's just hi. It's a polite form of hi. So she did not ask what's so funny. Uh, this is one of my pet bug bears uh, when you can read the subtitles and you see they're inaccurate. It always bugs me. Okay. <laughs> and now we're looking there at Ananda Everingham uh, playing Tun. He is half Lao, half Australian. Uh, he was born in Thailand. Uh, interestingly enough, the uh, directors chose a mixed race lead for their follow-up film, Alone, as well. Um, and there is, oof, a quite effective scare. Even though she was trying to be, uh, trying to be careful, she still had that, uh, had that road accident. To be honest, you might as well, uh, might as well have enjoyed yourself and gone all thinner. I mean, maybe maybe they need to swap positions for that. But then again, in, in Thailand, it's complex. So we'll move away from that very bad joke. It's a bit of a classic scare. It's delivered very early. We're only six minutes into the film and we've been set up for a major conflict here. We had some good hints earlier that I do just want to note, though, that group at the table joking that a man who's just got married has already gone out whoring. This is a setup. It will be paid off. Maybe a joke, but uh, it tells you a fair bit about their attitude here. Now, this is a really big difference from the American remake here. In the American remake, the body is gone. In this one, we have a decision by Ton not to take responsibility. Ton is going to tell, tell her that they're going to flee. He's going to tell Jane they're going to flee. That is a character decision that tells you a lot about him. You do not get that information in the American remake. This is one of the many reasons this version is superior. What can you derive from his character by his decision to flee? And her decision to be led by that? We'll take a little bit from it. So, uh, we talked about uh, Ananda Everingham. If you're wondering why, why does he have a sort of Western name, you've got that information. Um, Jane... Uh, was played by Natawiranuch Tongmi, who was also a model. Ananda Everingham also uh, is a sort of actor and model. And I think uh, Tongmi is going to give quite a restrained performance here. I think uh, she really is a sort of one who has a better acting chops in this, but I don't think anyone gives a bad performance. Now, as you've heard me mangling those names, you might be wondering, why is the actor's name so long? Why is a, why is a director and writer's name so long, but the character name is really short. You know, why do you have uh, Banjong Pisana Kun? Oh, apologies. Why do you have Banjong Pisana Kun and a character just called Tun or Jane? And uh, we, we've got a little while here to just do a little ground here. Let's talk about Thai names. The current setup for Thai naming conventions is very new. As in literally in the 20th century, uh, people did not have surnames. That is a new invention. And the idea when it was brought in was that everyone, to, uh, for ease of government identification, they needed a unique name. And the easiest way to get a unique name is you make it very long. And so that is why you tend to see these very long formal names. But it's somewhat against the cultural grain in Thailand, and so they've kind of kept the older system, which is that people will also have an effectively formal, informal name, a nickname. And calling it a nickname doesn't really do justice because it's a nickname you'd sort of only give to your friends, whereas in Thailand, your uh, informal name is basically the one that everyone uses for you. That will typically be just one, one uh, syllable long, and it might not even be what you think of as a name. Uh, of, the Thai people I, of the Thai people I knew, 
A lot of people had some brand names or some interesting uh, Western objects for names. I knew I had one called Bus. Uh, one of the uh, recent Thai prime ministers had a, a nickname that was Frog. Um, uh, the Thai word for frog. So it's um, it's a very unique naming system. I've never come across anywhere that uses it. But um, hopefully anyone uh, more familiar with Thailand will be relieved that I'm going to stick to the uh, the informal name as much as I can during this commentary, but hopefully you find that interesting. So this is something of a standard horror plot, right? You've had an accident and you've not, and you've done something wrong. You haven't faced up to it. Uh, in many cases, this is a road accident. So this is a bit of a standard setup for Shutter. You might be thinking, oh, this isn't particularly special, but from that basic plot, they're going to do a lot of really interesting stuff. And they've brought in the aspect already of these special photographs, what, what they're going to call effectively spirit photography. This has quite a lot of horror pedigree. Certainly the first horror film I ever bought, The Omen from 1976, makes a lot of the sort of cursed photograph aspect. In that one, someone's photo uh, would have an interesting mark on it that would be a clue to their fate. Uh, that was uh, David Warner playing the photographer Jennings, uh, had the pleasure of discovering that. In this, it's a little bit different. It's a little closer to Ring. Ring was the first, I believe, of the uh, US remakes of Asian horror films, remade in 2002. And I think Shutter may be very aware of that film and quite happy to take some of the ideas from it. This is not a criticism, it is an observation. Horror is frequently using common elements and it's all about how you present them. So the shutter version is a bit more like Ring where you're seeing something coming up on the photograph and it's going to be more of a hint rather than a kind of curse foreshadowing. But we've already had our first clue, we may not know that. And the use of photography is actually going to offer them a lot of elements with strong horror film potential. So think of things like uh, negatives that we just saw that all that automatically look a bit spooky. Photo negatives, they look weird. They're unsettling. Everything's a bit wrong with them. There are the dark rooms, which let you have a wonderful red ominous glow. And waiting for a photo to be developed also has a nice bit of tension in it. So they're going to really make use of the spooky potential of uh, using photo photography so much in a way that I don't think Ring did. This is why I sort of have no problem with them taking that element. It's, it's fine to use a common element in horror, fine to use a trope, but what you want to do is do something interesting with it. Something I find odd here is that their flat is, is weirdly neat. I don't know if that's a, a self-report for me, but uh, it, it does make me think this is a little bit like a set. It's just too neat. It lacks a bit of character, I would say. Now, this is one of those key moments. It's not in the US remake. We've seen some spooky goings on under the door in that dark room. We've seen that doorknob shaking. And you might be feeling a sort of EFAP ingrained response to say, why is a ghost shaking the doorknob? Has the ghost forgot the key? You might want to be snarking about that. I want you to resist that. That was my thought when I rewatched it in preparation for this commentary. I thought, by the way, I loved that shot with half red across her face. Really good, really good stuff. So I had that snarky response. Why is a ghost just spookily jiggling a doorknob? That is set up. That is a setup for a payoff we are going to get later and it is going to hit you like a ton of bricks if you haven't already made the connection. I am assuming that people have watched this film before they've listened to my commentary. If you haven't, that's an odd way of doing it, but I hope it still works for you. Uh, we're already been... This is really well lit. This Doesn't this have a kind of Suspiria vibe to it? I don't think that's deliberate, but that lovely red lighting contrasted with the blue... Uh, catching people at angles, so half is blue, half is red. That is classic Suspiria lighting. I absolutely love it. And this odd scare is... Uh... Okay, we are going to get another bit of cribbing here. Is cribbing too harsh? I don't think so. 
So this scene of the hair coming out over the sink, that is basically straight from Ring 2. But you know what, it's such a good image that the American remake of The Grudge also stole it. So, so why not? This is one of the bits that I'm less fond of, even though it's being sold really well. It's, um, I'm less fond of it. The scare wasn't really adjusted as much, unlike the uh, shaking of the doorknob, which you are going to get an amazing payoff for. And then when it turns out to all be a dream sequence, okay, that is a little cheating, but don't, I'm trying to be fair with this commentary. I want to talk about what's amazing in it, but I'm also going to talk about what's a little, a little bit of cheating. So there's going to be something set up in this conversation here, in there. You know, maybe the flat's not as neat as I worried it was. From this angle, it doesn't look as neat. You're going to see that whereas she is really affected by that incident and also by the accident where they hit the woman on the road, you're going to see that she wants to investigate. She wants to press forward. And Ton wants to shut it down. Now you can write that off. You can write it off as he's just more concerned about this. But on a rewatch, you notice that he is trying to kill the investigation. He does not want her looking into it. It really works out very well for the film that they both investigate. Otherwise, the reveal about Tun's culpability is uh, not going to land as well. Now, they do stretch the plot a tiny bit in order to uh, make that work. You know, some elements where Tun having a conversation with someone who also has the same information he has about uh, the ultimate inciting incident of this plot. They speak in more vague terms than perhaps they would, but I, I can allow it. I can allow it. By the way, I do not know what is happening here. I have tried to work out what it was. I thought, is this potentially, um, was that a prayer? Was that the equivalent of like when you light a petitionary prayer candle? I wasn't sure. I was, I was trying to figure that out. Um, in the research, I couldn't find it. When we're getting this very unfiltered product of another culture, some of it will not be explained to us. Now, in, in sharp contrast, the US version... Maybe I'll talk about that now for a bit. Um, the US version does not set this film in Thailand. It doesn't set it in America. But very interestingly, it sets it in Japan. They have a Japanese director. So they didn't go with the original team. They have a Japanese director in uh, Masayuki Ochiai. I hope I pronounced that okay. Who, from what I can tell, didn't have a huge amount of directing experience. And they have an American couple... Uh, with Joshua Jackson taking the lead there, playing the role of Tun, except he is Ben. Uh, the female lead character is Jane. Uh, so they managed to keep that name. Um, but they are going over and working in Tokyo. And that really bothered me. It bothered me massively because a lot of the film then gets taken up with a sort of outsider perspective. So Jane is going around... Japan and you're just sort of seeing the tourist highlights and it really sort of diverts the focus of the film and I thought are they going to do something interesting with it where she is able to identify more with them um, uh, that film's version of the ghost uh, in in Shutter and the, in this version she's Natri in the 2008 US remake she's Megumi are they trying to make a link that they are both outsiders they do not do this. Maybe it's in the subtext, but I did not really get it at all. I have to be really cynical and say that something I actually really have a big problem with is I think the American version relocated the story to Japan because they wanted to fit it into their trend of Asian horror remakes, of, of which there were so many, um, whether it's uh, The Uninvited... Uh, as I believe a remake of A Tale of Two Sisters, a uh, South Korean film in that case, uh, The Ring, The Grudge, One Missed Call, um, Pulse. Uh, they went through uh, The Eye as well. 
they went through so many of them. And I, I think rather cynically, the studio decided they wanted to take this Thai film and set it in Japan because American audiences were expecting another J-horror. And yeah, it's Asian, right? Who cares? Uh, maybe I'm being oversensitive there, but it really bothered me because this is a... You're going to see it's a very distinctive Thai product. And I didn't really like that they just sort of stripped the culture from it. You could have easily set the film in America, but they chose not to. Sort of took the approach that the uh, the grudge did of just sort of moving Americans over to Japan. And of course, consequently, they had to struggle with speaking Japanese. And is another great irritant of the US remake is that they assume a, a far greater level of Japanese spoken in, sorry, of English spoken in Japan than you'd ever find. That jump scare was very cheap, but gosh darn it, I'm going to admit that completely gets me. It's a very effective jump scare, even if it is cheating. I really liked it. <laughs> Did that one get you as well? I hope so. I hope so. So as I said, um, the US one has to play this silly game where they assume a huge amount of um, English is common in Japan. They have people who really don't seem to act like you'd expect Japanese people to act. Uh, for instance, it, uh, cases where Ben is working with Japanese models, speaking the odd word of Japanese and then just giving instructions in English really bothers me. It was, it was completely unnecessary and I think it was just sort of a bit cynical to repackage it to look a bit like something that they were more familiar with. Anyway, I will have further gripes about that film as we go along. It's a... Uh... The US remake allows us to make a very good comparison between uh, good filmmaking choices and bad filmmaking choices. We'll cover them as we go along. I really like this guy, he's got a good energy and it's just really nice to see an optimistic photographer. They tend to be quite uh, quite pessimistic I find, you know, photographers always looking at the negative. Now we'll go into a scene that is uh, more than a little bit reminiscent of Candyman, where my favourite film of all time. <laughs> and that is a bit of a classic device. We are going to get a lecture that is giving a subtext about the movie. It is an absolute classic cinema device. Why not use it? Why not use it? Yes, it's uh, giving us a subtext here that pictures aren't objective, that there is a lot of subjectivity. It seems actually very relevant to what we were just talking about, that you've got the same story set up here, but the angle you approach it from makes an absolutely massive difference. We're going to see some shots that were taken in very different styles and therefore work amazingly better in this than in the US version. Maybe I, I wasn't on as much of a uh, tangent as I thought I was. But it is getting across um, another idea that's very key to Shutter, the idea that what you see is not necessarily objective. That is setting us up for what Jane is going to realise as she goes along. The ghost is not necessarily, you know, the spooky ghost is not necessarily bad, and her loving partner is not necessarily innocent. Somewhat sad there, the, site, the magazines there do look very westernised. There's a bit of, um, if you want to go back and just pause on those magazines, have a little look at them, you see they're quite sexualised. The woman in a sort of, the boxing gear, the woman standing over the uh, Eiffel Tower there also has quite a lot of sexual connotation. It's a little sad to see that Western influence on Thailand, I've got to say. Anyway, French one was much more subversive. Now we're getting a bit of a seeding of the reveal at the finale uh, coming up fairly soon. I really like all these um, shallow focus shots that they do throughout the film. That was great. You go from the phone briefly to Ton to the background, just directing you to where you need to pay attention. The ominous red light also helps stand out against a fairly, uh, I would say, dull background of the rest of the flat. That was a really nicely composed shot, just gently bringing your attention over. I, I'm really seeing the Suspiria influence there. Now I'm starting to wonder if it was deliberate. 
We've also got another wonderful setup shot here. Just that extra effort that the uh, directors have taken there to show you the shot in the wing mirror just makes it a little more interesting. I really appreciate that in them. So there is a, a bit of an early setup. The American one kept that as well. And uh, it'll be used in a montage later. But that was torn just sort of paying attention to the neck. Something you don't necessarily focus on, but it's a lovely setup. As I said, something this film is going to do absolutely amazingly is a setup and payoff. Now, this will be a little bit cheeky here. Interesting bit. We're gonna we're gonna talk a bit about spirit photography in this. They're gonna tell you about it. They have an interesting take on it. Uh, it seems it's uh, not an uncommon belief that the soul can be captured in a photo. As I said, it's been used in horror movies a fair few times. Uh, it's got a long pedigree. Whether the idea that a camera can capture a photo of your soul and get spirits in it to specifically trying to capture spirits in photography, it's it's got a long pedigree. Certainly the Victorians are very, very interested in it. There's also a bit of a, a theme I get here in this set. It's modernity sort of sullying things with technology, taking the mystery out, because while that does have a long history, just seeing someone do it with Photoshop just kind of kill things a bit, kills the romance of spirit photography. It's a little, I don't know, maybe I'm over reading on that one, but I do sort of see it in there. There's... There's quite a cynicism in that aspect of the film. But it gets a bit more interesting here because this chap, yes, he acknowledges that he has to sort of produce photos to keep up with demand, maybe make more sensational photos that match what people are expecting. But he's not saying that he doesn't believe. I think that makes him quite interesting. He really does only get the scene, but I think he's quite fascinating as a kind of haggard, no, haggard's too strong. He's a slightly worn down journalist. He's worn out by the job, but he does have a belief. I know, can you believe folks? Can you, can you believe that a journo would be deceptive? No, shocking stuff, shocking stuff. Sort of getting across the idea that the truth, uh, the real thing is maybe a little less sensational than you might expect, but it does happen. However, we are going to get something incredibly uh, cheeky in it, incredibly cheeky, because after this, they are going to, after showing us about the faking of spirit photos and how easy it is to do it in Photoshop, they are then going to give you a spooky montage of spirit photos. That, for me, I find, um, it shows a lot of chutzpah, basically. Also, in terms of efficiency, the US shutter took 41 minutes to get to this section. And it also changed the uh, changed the definition of it. Whereas this set is talking about a spirit with a long a sense of longing, someone dies and they they're feeling a longing, and that's what prevents them moving into uh, moving on. Let's say the American one has, I think, a more westernized idea of basically any extreme passion, any extreme feeling, could cause the spirit to stay and not pass on. This is um. I know, it feels a bit more culturally specific. That's what I like. This is uh, this is that montage that I told you about that was a bit of chutzpah. Now, while they're going through that, I know what you're all waiting for. I know what you've been dying for me to talk to you about. Something that, you know, the question that's been on your lips ever since I started this commentary, you have been wondering, hey, what's a Thai film rating system? What's the cinema culture like? Was this, was this rated R? Was this rated NC-17 in Thailand? How do they rate their movies? I'm so glad you asked. I will tell you now. Now, interestingly, prior to 2007, Thailand didn't actually have, as far as I can tell, a film rating system that had uh, certificates the way we did now. They seem to operate like uh, the UK did right in the beginnings of the BBFC, where everything basically had to be assessed by a panel with representative moral upstanding figures who would assume as a basis that everything had to be suitable basically for everyone. And so films might be acknowledged and displayed as more suitable for adults, but all of them met a basic moral standard. However, in 2007, late 2007, they passed a law, uh, which was the Film and Video Act of 2007. And so from 2008, 
Thailand adopted a system of seven certificates and that is controlled by Thailand's Ministry of the Interior. So Thailand has starting with P for educational. They have a G for general audience. They then have a 13 suitable for viewers aged 13 and over, a 15, an 18, a 20, which is a bit more German uh, to have that category. And they also lastly have a band. So films that are not allowed to screen publicly in Thailand. Uh, they tend to be generally harsher on sex and nudity than violence in their films. So if you've seen other Thai films, maybe you saw Ong Bak when that went around, you note that it can show quite a lot of skull crunching, but um, nudity, not so much, much more restrained than that. So if you're wondering, what does Shutter get? It comes out with a 13, 13 plus. In the UK, it got a 15 certificate, I think quite understandably. There's going to be some very nasty stuff in this, some very challenging material in the realm of sexual violence. And in the US, it got an R rating. Another really cool fact about the Thai cinemas that I've experienced firsthand is that um, before every screening, they play the Thai national anthem uh, with the royal family displayed on the screen. And it is tradition to stand up and watch. A bit confusing for me the first time, but you know, you get onto it. And I thought that was absolutely awesome. Every screening, people stand up for the Thai national anthem. Brilliant. That's played into fairly sarcastically in Peter Jackson's Brain Dead, unfortunately, where uh, they played the old national anthem screening of our Queen, Queen Elizabeth II, before the film. A little sarcastic and snarky about it, but uh, if you want to see how it looked in New Zealand, you can look at uh, Peter Jackson's Brain Dead. Now, getting back to the more relevant aspect, we are getting um, a bit of a classic scare here. Now this scare sequence here, it's hinging on a bit of a classic setup that the spirits mess with the lights. In a horror movie, yes, the lights are always going to be janky. It's quite restrained. You really get only the tiniest flicker to notice something. It's it's quite unnerving. Um, and they're really taking advantage of the wonderful sound of the camera. With it charging up, it really is quite alarming. It made me think of... Uh, the ending of Silence of the Lambs with that charging up. Uh, you may also be reminded of Saw, which came out in 2003. I had a lengthy sequence of Lee wan ls character going around his dark flat, using the flash of his camera to uh, light the way. Very much like this scene. And given that that came out a year before Shutter, I can't help but wonder maybe they saw that. Uh, the American version of this, by the way, took the sequence buried it much later on in the film. Uh, did a fairly decent job of it though, if I may. We are now going to get another uh, wonderful bit of foreshadowing. Something that you just notice, hey, that's a bit odd, but uh, it's gonna pass by. It'll be wonderful at the end. For now, it's just a little bit of an oddity that you're just not really sure how it fits into the picture, but you will, you'll get it. Given that we saw flashes of Natri's ghost uh, so quickly there, it did make me think about how the release on video and especially on DVD has affected horror because you used to be able to do very quick subliminal things and really just assume that people were not going to be able to check up on them. You couldn't freeze frame and examine every single frame of a film. And so your effects could be a lot more forgiving. Whereas now... Um, you really do have to be aware of that. William Freakin obviously had a lot of fun with subliminals in The Exorcist, adding in uh, quick shots of the demon Pazuzu. And when he came to the director's cut, he seemed to have really gone into that and he added a bunch more in that I don't think were ever in the theatrical version. They stand out a fair bit more now, but from what I can gather, they are therefore much shorter than the original subliminals. That spooky photo uh, sound effect also made me think of Rear Window now we're at it, but um, we'll move on from that, we'll move on. So as I was saying, that scene where he's getting weighed and the scale is producing something that should be impossible, telling him he weighs a heck of a lot more than he does, is a lovely bit of symbolism as well. The idea of having, of carrying an extra weight, carrying an extra burden, as he is doing. We have a spooky payoff for it, but we also have this really cool symbolic payoff that I really like. If this sounds a bit obvious, forgive me, but I really enjoy these little bits that are put into this film because what they do is make the rewatch so much better. You just pick on, up on it so much. And it's something like 
Torn imagining her say, calling him a lying bastard. It's going to be referenced again later. I'll, I'll try and catch it, but I, I think the exact same insult is used. But it's obviously his projection as well, which should start to clue you in. You maybe don't pick up on it the first time. Is it just about that he uh, didn't report the body being hit to the police and he's running away and pretending it's okay? But on the rewatch, you understand that actually, no, that lying bastard, that's about something else. And how about this for symbolism? What's on the TV? Bit of a classic motif here. Something on the TV that's maybe unrelated, not in the least. He's watching footage of a mantis where the male has mated, but then the female eats the head. I mean, you should have seen this film already. You should not need me to spell out the symbolism here. But it's not just dropping that in. We will see a mantis again later, reinforcing that symbolism. This is something that the film is doing so well now. I did wonder, with it being shown, so, with the mantis scene being shown so close to the hospital scene, is it laying it on a bit too heavy? That he's got the soreness on the neck, he's carrying that burden, and then footage of um, a female mantis eating the male's head. Is that too much? Is it giving the game away that... When I first watched it, I didn't pick that up, so maybe not, or maybe I'm slow. That could also be true. Now here we are going to get another dream sequence, I'm afraid to say. It's a nice scare, but it is sort of cheating for me. Now I'm wondering with this, why is this happening? Why is the blood leaking? Is that symbolic of anything? The spitting out of the teeth is nasty, it's very visceral. But I'm, I'm trying to catch what's the relevance to what was going on. I was wondering, is that, is that Natri missing teeth from the accident? Um, is it replicating the injuries that she had from that? I'm not sure about it. I, I do struggle to connect it. So I think that might have been a bit more in the, in the realm of, we want to have a bit of gore. We want a creepy effect in there. I should probably actually praise the US version here. I want to say something nice about them. They had an equivalent version of that scare where it wasn't spitting out teeth and bleeding from the eyes, but there was a fly that moved under the skin and came out uh, from the eye that was very nasty, but also very related to what we knew was going to happen later, that um, uh, their version of the ghost, Megumi, uh, was dead and covered in flies so that that made a bit more sense that worked a bit better now hopefully you're remembering this guy from the wedding we saw him very briefly quite a while ago this is that conversation where i felt there was a little bit of cheating in the dialogue so what he's saying there bring me the photos what photos given the spooky stuff he's been seeing i think it should be on his mind when he's being told about photos he hid, remember that bitch. This should all be triggering Ton's memories. Why is he pretending he doesn't know? You know, that's that's what I wonder here. And to me, it's being played as very genuine. But I've got to say, I, I think he and Ton would probably have a very different conversation. This feels like a tiny bit of cheating to stop us, stop us getting it straight away. But I'm not going to be too mad because we are going to get maybe the best shot of the film. Second best shot. The directors are absolutely going to show off here. By the way, that puppet in the background just hanging up. What do you reckon that's about? Symbolic that they really aren't in control, that they've lost uh, lost the power on this. That uh, Natri really does have them uh, moving how she wants. That's what I would assume you would get from the puppet. Again, he's looking somewhere. We don't know what's going on. From that conversation, though, we can assume he does know what the photos being referred to were. And there is a neck pain again, all that foreshadowing. It's not too much. I mean, when I, when I point it out, it sounds like it's being laid on really thick. I don't think you necessarily get it on the first viewing. 
but he is continuing to look and we'll just remember where is he looking when we get to the end of the film. A little bit of serendipity there. Okay. Now this is, uh, this is setting us up, giving us a clue. Very much like Ring, as I said. In that one, you had a tape with uh, little clues in it. And once you saw them, once you could identify a place, obviously, um, I'm afraid I can only remember Naomi Watts as being in it. Apologies. Obviously, the Japanese original is fantastic too. Once they identified a location, they went to track it down to try and make sense of it. So the same device is happening here. We'll also see that they crib uh, a couple of images from Ring um, later on. Uh, the US was much more explicit about it. They absolutely nicked the image of the girl combing her hair in the mirror whilst looking at you. They stole that straight out of the Ring video. I'm afraid I can't actually remember if it turns up in this. You watch both versions and you can get them confused a bit. We'll see if it turns up. So Jane is following those clues, taking that initiative, and she is going out there with a Polaroid, obviously, because she can get the instant results. We are going to see the Polaroid be incredibly useful later. Also, Yasin, I hope you like the Polaroid. That one's for you, buddy. Hope you feel recognised. So watching this, I did wonder if we we're going to get this focus change. Yes, we did. They couldn't resist it. It's, it's maybe a little cheap. But if you want to say they're going for the gross out factor, you can do that. But in a story about a spirit that was, that's unable to, to escape, unable to pass on, don't you think it's kind of relevant that they have all these jars of dead things that have been kept and have not been able to degrade and pass on? I don't know, it doesn't seem as random to me. I think they've got good reason for doing it. It's also a much more interesting place to have this discovery. You might not think that necessarily, but uh, when I tell you that the US equivalent of this scene is just set in a model agency office, I think you can appreciate the choice here. This is much more interesting for us. Much... Uh, just a little bit more thought going into the setting to be visually interesting to us. Now, something else you're going to see, uh, familiar to anyone who watched my commentary on The Exorcist, we're going to see the wind stand in for spirituality here a fair amount. Maybe it's a bit more common than I thought. But watch out for that. You'll see uh, curtains blowing, you'll see candles blown out, and that's symbolic of um, a spiritual presence. Now, I also want to note here that what we're getting is absolute prime jump scare territory. This is the early 2000s. Jump scares are really going wild here. The way you can tell that is all the music has dropped. The pace is slower. You're getting a longer distance between cuts. You're being set up. You can even notice the actress is walking very nervously. And we're going to respond to that nervousness too. All of these are the hallmarks, the cues that we're going to get a big jump scare. And they do use quite a few jump scares in this, but, you know, we already had that really nice one where the photo just suddenly changed, but this is a bit more gentle. And maybe we should think why it wasn't a sudden, violent jump scare. This should give you a little clue that Natri maybe isn't the sinister evil force that you may have initially expected her to be, that she's just some vengeful spirit of a girl killed in a traffic accident. It's a nice little bit of setup that you can notice. We might also take a moment to ask ourselves, uh, along with the jump scares, why did we have so many Asian horror remakes at the time? My own little thesis on this is that after Scream came out in 1996 and completely skewered the very lazy slasher logic that was happening, Hollywood basically had a problem. Everything they were putting out was looking extremely passe, extremely unsophisticated. Scream had basically told them to do a better job. They'd also been very attacked by uh, Wes Craven's New Nightmare, the film he made before Scream, and Michelle Haneke's Funny Games, that came out in 1997, 
was very brutal on horror movies and the people who watch them. Might have a certain resonance for this film as well as we get into it. So Hollywood needed a new direction. They couldn't keep putting out cheap, low effort, low sincerity slasher sequels. So one of the things they tried was to do meta, but I don't think many writers in Hollywood were up to the task. And so they looked for other ways. So one of them was they leaned very heavily into torture porn. So Hostel, Saw, etc. Uh, was it Vacation? The one with Alicia Cuthbert. You've got things like that. That was one way they dealt with it. Then you have the wave of uh, remakes of the 80s horror classics starting in about 2003. And they managed to ride that out until uh, certainly 2010 with quite regularity. And they are still going on. Uh, and then the other direction that they had was to do these uh, remakes of, well, initially J-horror, but then Korean horror, and then they just widened it out. So the I is a Hong Kong horror as well. Uh, so they were trying that direction, and that lasted them for quite a while, until I suppose what they settled on was a, I guess, once again, a slightly more blasé, slightly more, uh, I guess, comedy horror aspect. Things like The Blackening, um, things like Bodies, 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 uh, or XXX, and the more serious realm of what you might call post-horror, although uh, that's kind of a disputed term. Uh, David Church has an, an interesting, if very academically biased book on that, um, the kind of thing that A24 was putting out. By the way, I don't know if you feel old yet, but you may have noticed that uh, the photo that uh, Jane found was from 1995. Yeah, fe feels old, feels old, man. If that wasn't bad enough, look at the VHSs they've got there. That is, that is weird for me. Now, this is from 2004. VHS started, kind of stopped being produced commercially, I believe in 2006. I think the last one that got a mainstream printing was A History of Violence. Now this is an absolutely amazing shot. Just incredible. Incredible. An unbroken take. Perfectly smooth. I'm not even sure how they did that. I would assume that Ton jumping off was kind of shot on a mat and then superimposed over and then they only started moving afterwards. That's how I take it. But the fact that you get that unbroken shot running towards the balcony and peering over, it carries you along with it. You have that sense of momentum. It's more emotional and it just lands. It lands wonderfully. I mean, maybe saying it lands wonderfully is a bit harsh to do when someone jumps off a balcony, but uh, that's the phrasing that comes to my mind. Here is a wife we met earlier about whom, uh, you know, the joke that she was already being cheated on. wonder if that's going to come in later. As I say, absolutely brilliant shot. Now in the US version of Shutter, for comparison, just made just four years later with a much bigger budget, they did that shot very differently. Uh, they had all the usual cuts, so uh, he goes off, you get a reaction cut to Ben's face, then you get a cut down, you don't follow him over the balcony. It was done in a much more standard way, a much less imaginative way. And when you have the comparison with what they managed to do here, on a much smaller budget, it really helps you appreciate so much more. By the way, a little bit of a double meaning there, and uh, it's all your gang's fault. Okay, so let's talk about this bit. Torn is just getting told that all his other friends from the beginning have killed themselves. They've all jumped off buildings. We're gonna get that specific detail here. We just see Torn go over and we're going to be told that the other two also kill themselves by jumping off buildings. This, again, is set up and payoff. And we also only see the one, by the way. Uh, the other one doesn't get covered. But what we're getting here is the idea of an echo. These things that might just seem like standard horror stuff, we're going to see are echoes of the original horrific incident that uh, led to Natri's death and ultimately to this haunting. The shaking of the doorknob you're going to see that in the pivotal scene. And you're going to find out that Natri also killed herself by jumping off a building. And so, all the ones responsible for her death, they are going to face the same fate. In the American one, do you think they did that? Absolutely no. Uh, one jumps off a building, as you gathered, but uh, the other two get basically random deaths that have absolutely no relevance. I mean, one of them has a digital camera 
improbably explode, taking his eye out and killing him. That's a guy played by John Hensley, who some of you degenerates probably recognise from Nip Tuck when you see him. Certainly it was weird for me to catch him in that. Uh, we, we'll talk about his character a bit later on. It's going to be very relevant. As for now, let's note, um, we are going to get a huge exposition dump here. And it's going to be done so wonderfully, so incredibly well. I'm going to find out about Natri, how Torn met her, and more complex dynamics. This is going to be shown to us with very little dialogue. The vocals are going to drop from this, and it's just going to be all image and all gentle music. He really does look very baby-faced there. It's really well done. By the way, just as we are getting a picture of it, we see that photo develop. It all starts to become clearer. Nice bit of symbolism. This film at this point is demonstering her. It's already telling you, as it's hinted previously, that Natri isn't a monster, she's not evil. And it automatically makes the film sadder. And it's just going to tell you their story without dialogue, just with the music. I, I really appreciate it. Can you guess what the American version did with this? That's right. Um, just to make sure you got it, just to make sure none of you missed it, because you thickos obviously couldn't infer things from just the images alone and actors acting, uh, they have Joshua Jackson tell you everything in explicit detail, just spelling it out. That is a nice looking Canon. I personally use an M M6 Mark II. That'll be an older model, but it looks very nice. Here is a bit of that restraint we talked about over sex and nudity here. They are keeping that very light. You can spit out the teeth, but no bubbins. Uh, no top nudity. Thank you very much. I think it says a lot that they trust the audience to pick up the cues. And on the rewatches, to pick up the foreshadowing. Um, if you, again, you should know this is very reminiscent setting up the ending shot of the film. Just the way she's clinging onto his neck there. Maybe on the first viewing you can already piece together his neck soreness and uh, and her then clinging on to him there. This, this comes across as incredibly sad to me. There's a scene that reminds me of very much in Stir of Echoes. If you've seen that film, you know which scene. But this is less malicious. It's more tragic. It's very believable that Sadly, you know, he's not a mature guy. He's kind of a coward, as we were shown from the start, where he refuses to accept responsibility. And so when she's getting bullied, no, he will not stand up to his friends. It is sadly extremely believable. Now, we've got some brilliant visual symbolism here. What she was just doing, cutting herself and bleeding into the solution. You see that blood drop into the solution. That symbolism is great. Also, remember the shot from earlier? that uh, Jane saw when she was in the dark room. Now, the symbolism we got from that is her blood is going into the photos, which is making a kind of visual sense for us. We're getting a visual connection. The photos are turning out cursed because her blood is on them. Now, obviously that is not literally what is causing the photos to be cursed, but is a symbolic connection that is very clear to us. The dark room, the chemicals are red, because of her suffering. Excellent stuff. By the way, her scream there is the first bit of vocalising for two and a half minutes. The film trusts you to just have that sequence and it stands out so much more than if he were just explaining it. And that is why that sequence sticks with me so much more. Also, the viscerality, the pane of glass cutting the hand, it, it is nasty, it's very painful. Uh, it's a kind of horror that is quite distinctive, but it's also easy to empathise with. Now, Tun here is making an appeal to helplessness that is really interesting for his character. He's saying, like, what could I do? What could I do about it? And remember that for the end. It's also sort of consistent. As we've seen, he doesn't face up to things. From the very start, he tries to run away rather than take responsibility. So he makes an appeal to helplessness that we may or may not believe. I do think genuinely he doesn't know what happened to Natri. I think he is more of a coward than uh, malicious. I think uh, all the evidence points towards that as we as we find out later. 
But there's also a really interesting moral challenge and idea that is underlying that idea of helplessness. And that is a sort of moral complexity around being a photographer. Um, remember, this is going to be the central thing. At the end, we're going to find out that he was witness to a recorder of a travesty, of a violent sexual violation. And he doesn't stop it. He doesn't instigate it. He doesn't participate. He just observes and records it. Now that raises questions about his culpability. How much does he deserve? I, I can't say it's a hugely complex question in this scenario. We are not fond of him. Fond of him. We do not admire him at all. But it, there is a wider question about it that is quite deep, I think. The photographer is an observer, a recorder, but they don't intervene. And is that right? I think we, we've all seen the prime directive in Star Trek where you do not interfere with insufficiently uh, developed civilizations, which is, uh, you know, taking quite a lot of particularist judgment. And we all think, you know, that's kind of fine, right? But think of more specifically something like war photographers or famine photographers, people who go to disaster zones and whether they have a moral responsibility. The most obvious incident that we can think of would be Kevin Carter, who is a chap who took the famous vulture and little girl photo in 1993. Uh, that was in the Sudanese famine. Uh, it turned out that the uh, child was not a girl, it was a boy called Kong Nyong. Uh, just on this imagery here, by the way, look how that camera is set up like an eye. The slightly lighter outer edge there looks so much more like an eyeball. Um, and it really gives you the impression that the camera is judging them, looking right at them. It's going to be useful for the finale as well. OK, I just thought I'd point out that good direction. It's a good shot. And there is a Thai flag flying proudly. So Kevin Carter takes this photo of, you know, a child basically dying of famine with a vulture right behind it. Very poignant. And he was haunted by this. He couldn't intervene. And he took his own life the next year at the age of 33. Absolutely tragic. There is... An obvious moral question you can ask about refusing to intervene, although I would just state that the idea of having to intervene, of having to act, is not necessarily right. It is complex, as the um, outcomes and unintended tragic consequences of, say, uh, decades of um, decades of foreign aid, which have funded warlords and kind of, in some cases, exacerbated famines, has proved. So kind of a complex issue. We, uh, we won't divert too much from it. Moving back to the film, this is of course a horror film, we are expecting a scare, and uh, this is a very special one. There is no doubt that this is going to stick in your mind, because this is very culturally specific, as we as we say. That slight uncanniness of the walking is done very well. You've already been set up for uh, just seeing footsteps and wondering, is that is that actually a ghost? They've taken this very relatable scenario and they're going to turn it into a wonderful scare scene but done in an unmistakably Thai fashion. <laughs> okay, we'll, uh, we'll let this play out. I mean, to be honest, isn't it scary enough to simply have to do what he's doing there to uh, try and speak and ask for the paper? Weird enough. And here you go. Yeah, they, um, as I said, some moments are very culturally specific here. They even add the fart sound effect, honestly. Um, <laughs> it's a serious dark horror film. This film is going to be going into some seriously dark places but they they couldn't resist a cheap fart joke yes <laughs> it's thailand that is a uh, katoi why what why why is that character using the men's loose you might wonder uh well that that's how they do it in thailand it's it's not the gender politics we have here or although you will notice um if you if you have listened out that uh that katoi character uh, transsexual character there, lady boy, however you want to refer to them, was using the chap's toilets, but did end their sentence with a formal ka, which is uh, how a woman would end a sentence, uh, rather than krup, how a man would. Yeah, in Thai formal speech, uh, men end sentences with krup, ladies with ka, and uh, listen out for that in the film, if you haven't already. Yes, um, something you kind of notice from all these I think the Thai sense of humour and informality is very distinct to them. Uh, the example that comes to my mind is Ong Bak, where this, you know, interesting uh, action film slips in a lot of graffiti written in English, directly talking to
two Western directors that it wants to cooperate with. Very cheeky stuff if you want to look out for that. Uh, Ong Bak is a great film. Highly, really good fun. Really worth watching. Uh, now, in this, away from action, back on horror, this is a lovely scare. A really lovely scare scene. She looks... Okay, she does look quite malicious in that, I'm going to say. Maybe slightly uncharacteristic how gleeful she is looking at tormenting him. It's maybe the closest that this film gets to cattle prod horror, as Mark Commode calls it. That's his word for jump scares, where you sort of go quiet and then effectively the film hits you with such a loud sound, it's effectively being shot with a cattle prod. That's the closest they get to it, but... I'm not exactly a fan of the jump scares myself. I think though they became so prevalent that effectively you got the anti-jump scares. It's a good scare. There is a mantis again. Did I not, did I not tell you they were going to show up again? And obviously we remember that has great symbolic relevance for this film. Uh, there's a there's a great one in The Witch, when the baby disappears at the start. Um, it's actually an anti-jump scare because the where you usually expect something to suddenly appear, there something suddenly disappears. And then if you watch something like the Conjuring series, something uh, they really focus on in that is messing with the rhythm of the scares. So they'll have the setup, you expect the jump scare, it doesn't pay off. And then you expect the next one and that doesn't pay off and then they hit you on a downbeat. So they really have got, they have basically seen that it's so well they basically seen that the jump scare is so well known that they can really just mess with the assumed rhythms and have it still work. Which kind of tells you that the jump scares were absolutely overdone. Now in this I really like that the uh, young boy, uh, the young monk is looking at him. Very knowingly, he's carrying that curse around. It's getting the sense that, oh yeah, you're, you're known. People can see. Maybe the uh, young monks can see in a way that the uh, no one else can. They've got that spiritual sight. It is lovely signposting. As in the ring, they've had to go out uh, effectively into the sticks, go somewhere kind of rural to track things down. And so they've ended up at Natri's place. And I think Ton here is really noticeably much more nervous than Jane. Notice how he stands back. He lets her go in front. He's talking, but he's standing behind her. He is much more nervous. He really doesn't know what the rules are here. He tried to keep that that relationship with Natri uh, quiet. He doesn't know what's known. I also think there's some interesting stuff with the bars there framing everything. Also, uh, let's take a moment here for a little bit of extra, um, I don't know, interesting Thai facts. You're hearing her say, did you drive from Bangkok? But she didn't say Bangkok at any point. Uh, just as a point of interest, uh, Thais do not call the capital city Bangkok. Uh, in Thai, it's Krung Te, which one of those interesting cases where we just have a totally different word. Um, like, I know, uh, Köln for Cologne uh, in Germany. Something that stands out to me. Now, they're both absolutely wrong-footed by this. We're a bit wrong-footed by it. The fact that the mum is basically saying Natri is alive. This close-up of the fly, I swear they... It's not a bad thing. I think they were inspired by the ring. There's nothing wrong with copying the best. But I think in doing this, you know, they, they had a couple of years to catch it. The American remake was incredibly uh, successful. I do think it's quite likely that... Um, Banjong Pisantana Kun and uh, Pak Pumong Pum looked at that and thought, oh, that's that's a good shot, we'll use it. And they're also bringing so much of their own energy to this, so you cannot complain. There's a, a nice bit where the bare foot there, I, I do think, is indicative of vulnerability. If you don't think bare feet going shoeless makes you vulnerable, I can only invite you to watch Pet Cemetery. Maybe I'm showing my own Western bias there. But they're absolutely wrong-footed here. In the US version, we do not see the mother. We don't have that wrong footing. We don't have the slightly surprising element of being told that Natri is alive. That's really weird to me when I saw that. What's going on there? And that was um, 
that they just go into the apartment, which again is it's just an apartment. They haven't had to travel out uh, anywhere interesting. Um, and then there's basically a, uh, well, I think I can say it without really being a spoiler. They have a sort of psycho Mrs. Bates reveal that you really are expecting already. This maybe is not as much of a surprise, but, and it's also, okay, it's a little bit of a jump scare, but... It's played differently. I think the mother gets to be very sympathetic. All these um, preserved butterflies. I know, I kind of get the feeling that Natri did all of those. The first shots we saw of them when she was really happy was with Thorn helping her photograph the preserved animals. And I wonder if she came back here and tried to do some lepidoptery preserving the butterflies. I wonder about that. Small scale, but maybe a bit of continuity. Also the idea of how fragile she is. Uh, the uh, thing being preserved, not able to move on. That symbolism is uh, is coming back again. Torn really is on very uh, thin ground here, isn't he? It's something, this is something that I absolutely love about Shudder. It does have its jump scares, absolutely. It goes into really dark places. But it's it's including this mother character. And she just gets to be in pain. The loss of her daughter is, you know, very obvious, very palpable, very emotionally strong here. And we are taking time, in a fairly short film, 96 minutes, we are taking time to pay attention to that, to see it as a tragedy. This is what you might call the Wes Craven rule and effect, that you want to remember that any character who dies and suffers in your movie is a real person with real connections and people who will miss them. If you remember that, you make a stronger film. It's something that I think was used. Probably the best case of it, I feel, is either The Haunting of Hill House, the series, or Al Orfanato from, I want to say, 2007. Don't Look Now as well. Great use of it. All of those reminding you that these are tragedies and the horror should actually affect you emotionally, not just be cheap. You don't want people to just be machete fodder. She does look like she's quite judging us there, I do think. I do feel that she's judging us there. Now, at this point, I believe in the burial ceremony, everyone has cleansed their hands with lustral water. The body has been washed. There is going to be chanting all night by the monks. What you saw earlier with the people just uh, going and donating to the monks, that is common practice. They are not allowed to, I believe, own any possessions, uh, including buying, so... Uh, they will rely entirely on things being donated to them. It's really quite a thing to see. It's um, And Thai temples generally, I've got to say, are absolutely stunning. When I visited them in Phuket, in uh, Kung Te, it really was quite stunning. The monks there really do have a very, a very humble life. Um, but at the same time, they are just, they're not completely sequestered. They do go out and they rely on people respecting on them, respecting them, valuing them, and being willing to support them in order to live. It's a very different culture. The spirituality is really still there in in all the daily life. Now, we should also remember to note that the mother did specify that uh, Natri jumped to her death, because, as I said, this is all about echoes, so that the wrong that was done to her is going to be revisited on everyone else. It's echoing back in upon them. So she jumped, they will all jump. But even though it's 67 minutes in, we've had a funeral, you may have figured this has been a fairly significant, great use of shallow focus here, by the way. Wonderful stuff. It's it's a lovely unsettling scare. Um, Even though it's been, well, 68 minutes at this point, you should feel that we have had a bit of resolution, but maybe you aren't expecting uh, the film to end. You shouldn't be. We've, we've had ourselves reminded that the new question isn't about what happened to her, where she is, but we're now, but now the question is the mystery over why she left Bangkok. And I do think that, you know, Jane should dig a bit more. She, she should keep asking Torn because obviously he knows something. She should keep digging. I do think it's a little bit of a cheat that she doesn't press him a bit harder, to be honest. Back in the funeral, I will note, uh, you saw the candle get blown out by the wind. 
That is that symbolism of spirituality being expressed by wind. And uh, there's a nice bit of consistent symbolism here. We're also seeing that everything is weighing on Tun, as it bloody well should by the end. We are having very low music here. You might think, are we setting up for a jump scare? Maybe not. It's coming out as a more sombre scene. They're letting the actors really carry you along. You're really, really just having some diegetic mu music here. It's a nice choice. It underplays things. Now to lower the tone, tie shoe on head. Jane really looks like the Thai version of shoe on head there. I, I can't escape. When, when I see this, I just think of that. Apologies. Hopefully I haven't um, polluted the film for you with that. And Jane is getting to show that she doesn't trust him. When he's saying he was a total asshole, she can see there's something more to it. She's looking searchingly at him. And she knows there's a little bit more to come. And from this, and you can tell this because when he's going to ask her, you know, do you love me? Uh, he's going to seek reassurance from her. She isn't going to give it. Now, they should be thinking, OK, the, the funeral has happened. The body has been cremated. Now that that has happened, Natra should be at rest. Really, that should work. But I suppose kind of like the end of Ring, you might feel there's a little bit more time left in the film. You might also realise there's a mystery left to be solved here. So here we go. We probably aren't ready for it to be resolved. We probably know there's a fairly bit, fair bit more to go. One of the things that makes this quite an interesting challenge to do as a commentary is just that there isn't that much material out there. And when it's involving, uh, say, matters of Thai culture, like the Buddhist rituals, I do feel that I am missing quite a lot of context that I really wish I could have. And there are little moments that I think would probably convey a lot more to me. We're going to come across a moment where you see the number four displayed significantly. You know, in Chinese culture and Japanese culture, four is very unlucky. Um, and I had to look around. Is that the same in Thailand? There's a thing about uh, butterflies are meant to be seen as rather creepy in Japan. Um, is that the same in Thailand? You do wonder. Um, it's one of the... As, as much as I enjoy this film, I do... I do sort of struggle knowing that I'm probably missing out a lot of cultural context here. And, you know, we do our, mo our best. So if you think maybe I've sort of overdone it on adding cultural depth into this, uh, please do forgive me. But I'm sure there's so much more in there that I, I wish we could understand. Um, so you just saw there, he did reach out for reassurance. She didn't give it. She is suspicious. She's not endlessly supportive. And there is a wind again, just as in the funeral. There is the wind again. That should be cluing you in. We're going to get a bit of a uh, spirit sequence here. The US version, by the way, they did a version of this scene and they really dragged it out. There's basically one sequence with Natri coming in and getting into the bed. The US, it's almost like they decided we, we want these scares. We don't know which one to go for. We'll try about three different versions of them. They make their version of Natri Megumi kind of sexually voracious and she kind of forces a kiss onto the protagonist Ben with a rotten tongue. It's a very grim effect. He ends up vomiting. It's, I don't know, it just feels less subtle. It makes it a bit harder to feel sorry for uh, their version of the ghost here. Natri, I don't think, ever falls into that trap. It's not as confused in the messaging. But we'll, we'll talk about some of that confusion in the messaging later when we get the uh, really big reveal. Because there's quite a bit of hypocrisy in the American version. By the way, why is he sleeping in jeans? I do have to wonder. Odd little detail there. Why are you sleeping in the jeans? The sound is totally dropped here, of course. Are you ready for another jump scare? Are you, are you aware of the rhythm of this? We've had the build-up. We haven't had the big payoff. When's the scare coming? You must be ready for it. We've gone for a close-up on his face. A very tight frame. A POV. Where is it? Yes. You probably saw that coming, okay? I know. Remember, these are filmmakers who are 24, 25. It's their first full-length film. They've done a couple of shorts. Um, and they will be honing their craft. You know, they, they did a, 
a whole bunch of horror films as I said they later moved into uh, romances by the way interestingly enough they did a couple of romances in I want to say 2013 and 2016 the last one was um what's it called Hello Stranger and One Day in 2016 which I think itself may be an adaptation of a western story there is that shot of four which is meant to be a bit of a disaster so um in Chinese and Japanese, it's uh, similar to the word for death, she. So it's avoided for that reason. I wonder if the focus on that means it's the same in Thailand. If you remember the Silent Hill game, the first one, it's uh, going to the fourth floor in the hospital is what uh, transports you into the dark realm. We're getting set up for a really good sequence here. The fact, I think it, it is meant to be that four is a... It's a creepy sign. Oh, that is quite a nasty scare. He's transposing his, his guilt directly onto, onto Jane. Oh, wonderful stuff. Just want to note that running through the corridor there, that is hugely inspired by the grudge. Uh, the bit where Natri's in the corridor, following him down it, just straight out of Juan. You'll, you'll see that as you go on. If you, In fact, even the American remake used it, if I recall. However, they didn't get this upcoming shot, which is absolutely fantastic. We should be remembering that the other three all fell to their deaths. We should be primed for this. We should be remembering it. Now, Ton isn't going to get that fate yet, but we are going to get this absolutely brilliant shot looking down from overhead. I think it's absolutely stunning. I love it. I uh, the one the uninterrupted shot of uh, Ton falling down. Oh, let's just take this in. That is so good. I love it. Just uncanny movement. It's so offset. It's so off-putting. She should not be able to do that. Just really wonderfully done. I also think the musical cues here are very close to some of the cues in The Shining. Some of the there's a sort of rattling effect that tends to play at a few key moments, and I think it was really similar to that. That shot was reused, I think, of her going down the uh, ladder. I don't care. It looks amazing. That is the directors being ambitious. Oh, it looks so good. Yeah, I really get vibes of the uh, Shining soundtrack from that. I think it's uh, a track called uh, Utrange from uh, Christoph Penderecki, if I recall. But uh, don't don't um, hold me to that. The bit of the uh, eyes flickering there, you almost wonder if that was a sort of reference to uh, REM sleep, the rapid eye movement, like uh, the implication was he was still kind of dreaming. But I th he must have fallen. You might be expecting my regular complaint at this point. Uh, the US version of Shutter does not have that shot at all. That shot that was so gorgeous, so ambitious, looked really distinctive. Um, they don't have anything like it. They uh, just have that section that I talked about where they have one jump scare, then a gross out scare, then another gross out scare. Then a sequence where Megumi uh, appears to sort of separate Jane off and smash her head into a window. Even though she smashes her head into a window and the window breaks, she doesn't get a cut up face like you would expect. I imagine that would be quite a difficult makeup job to do, but that would be a tricky thing. Uh, they don't do that. It's a total cop out. It falls for easy gross out effects and I get the vibe that they just didn't know which one to go with. So they went with all of them. Of course, I saw the uh, unrated cut of that. So possibly the regular version, which is about eight minutes shorter only limited it to one of those. Ah, here we go. So, um, I may have messed up a little bit there. The reason they were saying in bed that everything would be okay today is because the monks had to do the chanting overnight. And it's actually today that the cremation happens. Apologies if I messed that up a bit. Um, over the course of doing these commentaries, your mind is racing. I've got to say, it's quite the challenge to keep going. Uh, just taking the moment again. This is unfiltered Thai culture and it's lovely to see it. You don't have an American in there giving you a loud, uh, dumbed down exposition over what's happening. 
Now they do have the cremation there because Japan has similar Buddhist traditions. And it shows you inside the coffin, a, a kind of unpleasant effect, but I, I thought it looked okay. There's no harm in it. Again, moving up, the idea of the wind, of uh, her sm the smoke moving along, should give you the idea of the spiritual. So, nicely done. And again, leaning on visuals without exposition. It's really appreciated. At 79 minutes in, you might be starting to think that now we're all paid up. We're all good. We've cremated the body. We've had a really big payoff scare sequence that feels like a finale. And now it's okay. You could genuinely watch this and think, okay, we're done. This is a resolution, right? It's all solved. You watch a few more films and you get a sense just from the editing and the rhythm. Okay, there's a bit more to go. Um, in this case, we've got about a quarter of an hour of extra footage here. And we might start to remember, okay, there's something else. By the way, she's wearing a cross there. I did wonder, is she Christian? There is not a huge Christian presence in Thailand. I think it might be a bit more of a fashion statement as it so often is in, um, in the West generally. But I did just wonder. So everything should be resolved. They have gone on and gone on holiday. We're set up for a spooky scare. Classic. Yes, as I said, the Thai sense of humour is very unique. Um, I don't know, it, China, Chinese films, it, they'll happily tell you how fat you are uh, to your face, so maybe it's not uh, all that unique. You're also noticing in the background all the royal portraits there. Um, as I, hopefully you got from me discussing cinema culture where everyone stands for the national anthem, the, ro the monarchy in Thailand is very well respected, or certainly uh, King Bumapul, um, the, I, I'm afraid I, I'll mangle the name if I attempt it, but the king who died, I think it would be about 10 years ago now, had a very long reign, was very well respected. This extra sting of the scare, it's really hard to pull off in a horror film, I think. Just from the rhythm, the fact that it hasn't ended, you haven't gone to credits, you're expecting something more. Think of Final Destination, think of Drag Me to Hell. It's hard for it to creep on up on you as much because the film's simply not ending yet kind of gives it away. Although we should remember, we still haven't found out what happened to make her leave Bangkok. So we've still got this to go. If you remember, this is being taken when the camera was looking at them in a shot, accusedly. We saw the shutter just open and it's like Nathra just did this herself. But they found such a great way to present the information. Making a sort of do-it-yourself zoetrope here. A sort of impromptu stop motion. The uncanny movement again sticks in your head so much more. It's a great way to show it. It's a wonderful presentation here. Wonderful stuff. Anyway. So here is our payoff. Now, I'll note that in the US version of Shutter, you don't have the slight sort of implication that Natra let that roll, uh, sorry, let this uh, all just come out. Uh, in the US one, you think for a second that the photos are hidden behind a large scale frame photo of Jane. That would have been a bit silly, wouldn't it? you got to remember Ben, Pun, they aren't fans of this. They try to hide it. Uh, but in the US one, it's hidden in a storage room in a suitcase. It seems to me a little, I don't know, a little, little weaker that they found it that way. Now we're going to find out what made her leave Bangkok. It's going to be horrible. It's going to be genuinely horrible in this. It's going to be hard to take. Uh, Singar may be uh, not super happy to have their brand associated with a rape scene. In the US version, it was an Apple MacBook Pro. They had this... They were showing the photos of the upcoming rape right above the Apple logo. I personally, I, I, I'd have tried to get that out of the film if I were Apple, but there you go. There is a doorknob rattling. If you're wondering why is that there in the beginning in the jump scare, no, it is not cheap. It is a foreshadowing. It is an echo. It is a setup and a payoff. This really is quite hard to watch. You notice like, this is something horror still takes very seriously. They don't have to show much here for it to be absolutely horrific. Switching to a dark room here helps make it more sinister. Generally, sexual violence in horror is treated incredibly harshly uh, with 
obviously good reason. And because the taboo has stayed there, it's kind of, it helps it still land. When you have sexual violence in horror, it really does work very well. I'm thinking of The Hills of Eyes in particular, and thinking of Irreversible. We've seen decapitations, disembowelings, tongues being ripped out. We're, we're, we're very used to when some someone's body ends up popping up in the last reel somewhere, uh, eyes gouged out, fingers cut off, teeth knocked out, to, uh, well, you know where I'm quoting that from. We're used to that now. Sexual violence hasn't been cheap cheapened. I think animal violence hasn't been cheapened, and it still remains incredibly hard-hitting. So I, I find that scene really hard to take. It's, it's delivered very well. It doesn't show anything exploitative. It's just extremely painful. Now there's an interesting thing with what's happening here. What he's asked to do, he doesn't take part, he just takes a photo. And I think in the cultural mores of Thailand, the idea is that there's probably a shame culture, that having the photo will be something that can keep her mouth shut, basically. Like it, just to show the photo will shame her, and that's why she'll keep quiet. It's something that sounds a bit alien uh, to me, but I think that's what's going on there. In the US version, it's there as well, but it really doesn't translate. Even though it's happening in Japan, I just don't know. You'd think uh, for the Americans, it wouldn't translate. They wouldn't have that idea, because why would you say, please take incriminating evidence? But the US also makes an even worse blunder with that because in their in their version, it's not students, it's advertising executives. And they have a section where um, the guy played by John Hensley, who dies with a camera exploding in his face, he dies taking photos of a model. And they're trying to make a sort of me too point about the uh, casting couch where this guy who, as he says, he's asked what his job is and he says he reps models, which I thought was nice sort of, uh, homophonic pun, you know, it's like he reps models, he rapes models. I thought that was a bit of cleverness in the US one, if it was intended. So he has brought a model in to take photos of her for his private collection, all to help her career. It's kind of a casting couch thing. And the trouble is, the film is expecting us to condemn it, just as we're meant to condemn the photos that are taken of Natra here and of Megumi later. But the trouble is, the film lets us enjoy this gorgeous model in lingerie who's having these manipulative photos taken of her. The film is eating its cake and having it too. It's cheating. It's a hypocrisy that I think the film isn't aware of. Whereas Shutter here, the, the original Thai version, does not fall into that trap. It totally avoids it. Because of their choice not to use uh, exposition over those scenes, I think you also have a little more ambiguity over Ton's role. Did he ask them to, you know, like, what did he say to sort of imply that they could have their way with her? You are left wondering, what did he say to them that made that happen? Did he say anything at all? Did he just kind of complain that she was being clingy? Or was he too shamed to talk about the relationship? Is it just that they turn up drunk randomly and decide to harass her with no... um uh, sort of no motivation, no prompt from him. It could play out that way. I think we don't really know. But either way, he turns up, he sees the injustice, he takes the photo. He doesn't stop it, he just witnesses and records it. And that is more than enough culpability for this film. You know, relevant to my criticisms, the film for sort of criticising the casting couch whilst also uh, letting us revel in it. I did mention that Michelle Henneke's Funny Games takes that idea to a wider um, stance to criticise all of horror, where we're criticised for even seeking out this violence. It's an interesting one. I know where I stand on that one, but uh, people might want to say that uh, my stance is hypocritical. I don't know. What, watch Funny Games and come to your own judgement. This frenzied search for where the ghost is, you know, Jane has stormed off. Uh, he's, he's seeing that, okay, the cremation has not solved the matter. So he's hunting for Natri now. How else could it pay off? This is lovely. Is it a bit contrived that the Polaroid would take the photo? Maybe. Maybe a little bit. Maybe you could say Natri helps it happen. Um, you could certainly nitpick over that. 
This choice is to keep us waiting for that photo. His feet are out of focus, the camera remains in focus. That's the main thing that matters. And here is your payoff. I said I thought they were taking some ideas from the, from the West. I think this is a montage straight out of Sixth Sense. I really think they saw the revealing montage at the end of the Sixth Sense. And they thought, we can use that. And they certainly do. They use it to great effect here. This is creepy as hell. Now, I think how they sell his response to it is a bit trickier. You know, it's it, you can't feel her, really. You can't knock her off. What do you do? Now, I think they handle it better than the US version, where Joshua Jackson's character decides for no reason that I can put to electrocute himself repeatedly. To, I don't know, shock the ghost off. Doesn't make sense to me. But um, I think they handled it a bit better. It's a briefer sequence. It's less visceral. It feels less of a stretch to me. Something that's maybe a little harder for us to appreciate is the significance of her being on his shoulders, holding his head. Uh, that has a lot of cultural weight in Thailand. Uh, the idea is that the head is a spiritual zone. Uh, you do not touch it really. You're, that's very intimate. So where we would happily pat a child on the head, in Thailand you would not do that. Uh, that is seen as very intimate, very disrespectful. And so the fact that the ghost is there onto his head carries a lot of um, a lot of cultural significance. Like she's blocking him spiritually. She's tied to his soul because she's clinging onto his head. It's nicely done, I'd say. In the West, we do not get that. Uh, I had that explained to me by Thai friends. Um, I was actually introduced to this pretty much when it came out. Very lucky to have a couple of Thai friends who introduced me to a lot of the movies they enjoyed, and this was one of them. We're fully in the denouement here. It's going to be a fair bit more restrained. He is absolutely beaten. That scar is making you wonder what's going on here. How damaged was he? And you have to note, he also fell. He had to fall. But the scar isn't our payoff. This is our payoff. The show that the site that confirms he will never get rid of her. He will never be free of that guilt. It is haunting. It is fantastic. I do wonder what that special notice we've got there here, but feels like it's maybe a uh, later edition. You know, it does happen. Think of the devil's advocate and the fact that they uh, had that lawsuit, which meant they had to apologise for using a tribute to a statue in the film that was improperly credited. Anyway, that's, that's maybe taking us away a little bit. I really hope you liked this. I hope you saw that this film had some horror cliches, but like Scream, it made amazing use of them to turn those cliches and tropes into setup and payoff that helped the story land so much better. On the rewatch, it's so rewarding to catch all that stuff and you just see how well delivered it is. You also get to appreciate just how much effort was go had gone into making some of those memorable shots that help it stand out. So, so I hope you liked it, despite the appalling lack of diversity in that film. You know, absolutely execrable. How could they? Uh, I hope you got over that and still really enjoyed this, especially if you would have never seen this film otherwise. I, I really hope I introduced it to you and you enjoyed it. If you want to go further with this, um, you know, I'd say a good place to go is to check out the rest of the stuff from the directors. I've got to admit, I've not seen it myself, but having done the research for this, having rewatched it a couple of times for the commentary, I absolutely want to check out the rest of their stuff. So I'll, I'll be putting the follow up to this alone from 2007 uh, on my watch list. That's basically everything I've got to say about Shutter. I hope you found it informative. I hope you found it interesting and I hope you're uh, I hope it's been an interesting exercise in how choices for the same story end up making one film fantastic and one film decidedly mid. Uh, I, all I can say is, yeah, do do avoid the American version. It is not worth it. It is a dumber, a more gratuitous, more improbable version of the same film, even if there are maybe a couple of shots that do look visually quite interesting. Some of the shots where Joshua Jackson is doing photo shoots. They look quite interesting, but otherwise it is a vastly inferior version of this wonderfully original film. That is everything for me on Shutter. 
Uh, please do check out the rest of the commentaries I've recorded for the Rental Breakdown project. And please do watch the project itself, which, as I said, is covering the history and cultural impact of Blockbuster Video and trying to kill the myth that the demise of Blockbuster is entirely down to Netflix. I hope that sounds interesting to you. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks, y'all. Cheers.